Hello, my name is Chris White, and I'm the Director of Engagement here at Climate Reality Project. I'd like to welcome you to the 24 Hours of Reality and our third global dialogue exploring the powerful role of natural solutions in our climate fight. This year, 24 Hours of Reality, Spotlight on Solutions and Hope, celebrates all the incredible progress people of all ages, ethnicities, and all walks of life are making in our fight to stop rising temperatures and build a healthy, equitable, and sustainable future together. This is the day to share stories and ideas to learn what works and how we can all make a difference, to find hope and inspiration, and then go back to our own communities and get to work. These global dialogues are a chance to connect voices and perspectives from across the planet and take this process forward so that together we can learn from each other and build a stronger movement to win. We have an incredible panel today to explore this issue. But before I introduce them, I want to share that the audience can ask any questions you have for the panelists by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will be asking a few of these questions later in the broadcast. I'm excited to get started and introduce our host and moderator, our founder and chairman, and former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. We are also joined by Iwi Lama, Iwi is an environmental and climate justice advocate at Forests, Resources, and People, and Director of Programs at the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy. Iwi has worked to train and empower a new generation of female entrepreneurs in Cameroon with skills in sustainability and nature-based climate solutions from agroforestry to beekeeping. Next, please welcome Christy Borley a lawyer and writer from Trinidad and Tobago. Christy is a climate reality leader and former vice curator of the Global Shapers Port of Spain hub, where she helps develop a program and teach and empower local farmers and communities with regenerative farming techniques. We are also joined by Diana Wainand. Diana is an author an activist and currently chairs the Climate Reality Project's San Fernando Valley chapter, which advocated for nature-based solutions to be used when redeveloping the Los Angeles River Draft Master Plan. Finally, welcome Hannah Astorinti, a communication and engagement specialist of the Climate Reality Project Indonesia. With a robust background in organizing powerful opportunities for building connections, Hannah helps bring the Climate Reality Project's Indonesia's various outreach efforts to life. Now, to get things going, I am honored to introduce our moderator, Climate Reality founder, and chairman and U.S. Vice President, Al Gore. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for the work you, you do for Climate Reality. And welcome back, everybody, to 24 Hours of Reality, Spotlight on Solutions and Hope. This is our third of four global dialogues today, all of which have been featuring climate activists and their achievements in driving real change and real solutions in their own communities. So far, we've discussed the importance of accelerating a just transition, as well as the steps we've taken to usher in a new era of zero carbon transportation. And if you missed either of those sessions, I encourage you to visit 24hoursofreality.org to learn more about advancing solutions in these areas. Now, for, for this next hour, our focus is going to be on solutions rooted in the earth itself, pun intended. Uh, today, many natural carbon sinks are under threat. Forests, wetlands, and other natural resources like topsoil have been compromised due to um, deforestation, development, and harmful agricultural practices. We know that if we want to truly win our climate fight, we must protect nature. We need to protect nature. We need nature's help. Now, by supporting conservation, uh, preserving biodiversity, and adopting regenerative agricultural practices, we can drive critical solutions. As you heard in Chris's introduction just now, the four activists that you're just about to meet are doing precisely that. So I wanna jump right into the discussion and hear from them about their work. And uh, let me start off with the question for 
all of you, um, you each work in very different kinds of ecosystems in terms of biodiversity, geography, and in terms of the political environment. So I'd love to hear from each one of you about what natural solutions you're advocating for in your region and why you believe they're so important. And um, Hannah, why don't you start us off? Thank you so much, Mr. Gore. As a tropical country with large biodiversity, Indonesia has so many resources. Over the years, people gain so much benefit from life below water and life on land to the point where it's now beyond the limit. And highlighting the natural um, solutions that we're currently doing in climate change in Indonesia, where 50% of the climate leaders are together with them to raise awareness and move the public about nature-based solutions. We are putting joyful activism into our works. So we want to make sure that everyone is having as much fun while not forgetting the sense of climate actions. And together with the youths, we have summer camps called Youth Leadership Camp for Climate Crisis. It's a three-day camp to discuss um, about climate topics that's currently happening right now, um, specifically in the specific regi uh, region that we're targeting. And the most recent one was biodiversity and water protection in a rainy city of Bogor, Indonesia. And after the camp, this is the most important thing about the camp, um, each participant will gather into groups and they will run projects based on the knowledge that they gain during the camp. They have successfully made changes in their respective area of origin. So they bring back all this knowledge and they made something out of it. And it was such a great pleasure to have seen the reports that they made. And the projects, the team that they're uh, bringing uh, are increasing awareness about utilizing rainwater for consumption and preserving endemic plants of one area and also a direct education to school and also local communities about climate issues. Yeah, great. Well, wonderful start. Who wants to go next? Uh, Diana, Yui, Christy? Sure, I'll pop in. Hi, uh, Mr. Gore, thank you. Um, I'm in Los Angeles and Los Angeles is home to um, over 10 million people and it's grown pretty fast as urban areas do. So it spent the past 80 years sort of paving over and sort of erasing natural processes. And, uh, you know, you can call that progress for a minute or two, but, you know, after a while, it really uh, created a lot of damage. So for us, it um, uh, depleted our groundwater basin, uh, increased fire and flood risk, it polluted our air and water, it exacerbated our heat islands, destroyed biodiversity and eroded public health. And so what we um, feel is the solution to that to try to help, you know, reclaim some of that, um, rebalance it is to move more in towards natural solutions. And for us, that means um, the area that we're supporting and working on the Sepulveda Basin has about an eight mile stretch where the Los Angeles River runs through it. We really want to see that river be allowed to return to its natural flow so that by doing that it does has all sorts of uh, benefits it will you know Im improve biodiversity it will mitigate climate change and will have you know more natural sequestration um and it will create a sort of a, a new york uh, central park like oasis in the heart of los angeles yeah great uh fantastic uh, Let's see, uh, who, who wants to, to go next? Christy um, in Trinidad and Tobago? Yes, yes. thank you, Mr. Gore. Um, so yes, in Trinidad and Tobago, 85% uh, of our food consumed is imported, uh, while agriculture contributes just about 1% to our GDP. So such a heavy de dependence on imports to meet the nutritional needs of our population, it really exacerbates several environmental, economic, and social issues, um, including vulnerability to glo global shocks in supply chain, as we saw in the pandemic and we're seeing now with the war on Ukraine. 
Uh, and then, you know, that results in, in increasing inequalities, underprivileged communities are always the most significantly affected. Um, and then, well, of course, imported food also means greater carbon emissions, air pollution, and contributes to climate change. And so farmers in Trinidad and Tobago, they already face significant weather related adversities, uh, such as flooding and droughts. Um, there's a lack of a widespread knowledge of sustainable farming methods, which can contribute to land restoration, climate change mitigation, and increased soil fertility. Um, so we really, we know that food security and sovereignty for our island nation is going to be a key determinant of our resilience in the face of climate change. And just really a need for an expansion of the agricultural sector. Uh, but it shouldn't just be sustainably. We're at a point where it must be regenerative. And that's where natural solutions comes in. Um, we are promoting agricultural methods that work with the balances of nature to restore farming ecosystems while producing healthy, high quality food. Well, thank you very much. Um, Ui, Ui Lama in Cameroon. Hello, sir. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, in Cameroon, in uh, Limbe, and presently I'm in the eastern part of carrying out some work in one of the forest communities there. But my focus uh, area where I uh, work is called the Bimbia Bonadikumbu Community Forest, and it is at the foothills of Mount Cameroon, which is an active volcano. Uh, Mount Cameroon is one of the last remnants of lowland forest between the urban centers of Limbe and Douala, our economic capital. And this uh, lowland forest faces high human pressure, leading to massive deforestation through increasing plantation expansion, charcoal production, wood exploitation, and other artisanal farming. This forest covers the entire eastern part of my city limit and is characterized by a hilly topography. The effect of this deforestation is taking a high negative toll on my city. And over the years, there has been increasing hazards of landslides and floods, accompanied by poor crop production as a result of poor quality exposed and loose soils from the hilly slopes. And despite its seaside location, Rising daily temperatures have become unbearable within Limbe and Douala. This hits the hardest on the woman because she is the main caregiver in the house. So natural solutions in this area, we address and are addressing the impact of deforestation and degradation on the environment of Limbe and its environs. And it is further restoring the ecosystem of the Bimbia forest. And on the other hand, it is addressing the problem of cross-generational biocultural forest and microhabitat destruction. This is being done through establishment of fruit nurseries and indigenous tree nurseries. And we are moving on to establishing solar-powered nurseries for reforestation of degraded forest patches. Once also established these nurseries, we are also establishing some of them for inexhaustible and rigorous tree planting within our community. Presently, we are working with Echo Club creation in schools and raising climate change ambassadors. And we've been able to work with over 500 young people between the age of 7 to 15 in schools in Cameroon. And we are empowering over 5,450 women with permaculture skills, capacity building activities like home gardening, beekeeping, mushroom cultivation, micro enterprise development transformation of forest products by adding value to them and we are raising mm. awareness campaigns through radio talks and all of these activities we plan that we will further establish micro enterprises for these women and young girls in these communities in the long run we believe that we can establish a girls institution where we can train over 100 girls yearly in this institution on climate change, natural resource management initiatives. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn to you on this uh, to go first on this next question, Yui. There's no doubt that the work you're doing, that all of you are doing, can be challenging at times. And I want to ask this to each one of you. Uh, what do you see as the greatest challenge your community will have to overcome in the course of advancing natural solutions? Uh, uh, Uwe, Uwe uh, let's uh, start start with you. You've got the floor, uh, uh, and then we'll go to someone else. All right. Thank you, sir. One of the greatest uh, challenges, there are quite a few challenges in uh, my communities that my, uh, my community needs to overcome mm -hmm for natural solutions to be effective within these communities. And one of, the, one of the challenges is the traditions and cultures within my communities. In 2020, I, was, I conducted a research, which was my master's research, and it was looking at, it was assessing women's inclusion and decision-making platforms and programs. And in the course of uh, my analysis of my results, I realized that the reason women were not involved in climate change programs and projects was because first they had low self-esteem, low self-esteem, which has been determined by their cultures and their traditions that tell the woman to have her place in the kitchen and not anywhere when it comes to policies, laws, or development. Also, there was poor representation. As a result, there was poor representation in the management board, in the local councils, in these communities. And then these women had limited knowledge about um, access to forest land, because the only land they had was land that was they could walk on, uh, pass on to them by their husbands or their brothers or their fathers. And this has all boiled down to the fact that the cultures in these areas have prevented women and girls mm. from taking part in leadership roles and in management uh, activities. As a woman, when I went into these communities conducting my research, I had a lot of issues personally, where the communities thought that I was not brought up in a good home because I was able to stand and advocate for other women. So they were they termed me poorly trained. They termed me on um, on mannerly because according to the African culture, you are supposed to say yes to whatever the the patriarchal society tells you. But when I came in with a different perspective and they realized that their wives, their children were beginning to gain knowledge on some of their basic uh, needs and right around climate change and natural resource management. It became a huge challenge. Over the years, things have been changing. Wow. Oh, well, that's been quite an adventure for you. Uh, who would like to go next? Uh, Christy, Hannah, uh, uh, please, uh, please, please go ahead, or Diana. Sure, I'll go. Um... Yeah, so challenges uh, working with a natural solution like regenerative agriculture. Uh, it requires a, quite a shift in mindset, um, lifestyle perspective. For example, to restore soil to its natural fertility after having used pesticides and artificial fertilizers for decades uh, will take some time. And this isn't ideal for the farmer who is trying to produce, to provide for his family and community, um, and simply cannot afford setbacks to yield in the transition. Um, and it's difficult to make these systemic shifts if reward does not seem within reach. Uh, but thankfully, our incredible partners in the Food For You program um, have been at this thing for years. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge, around the ways to make this transition as smooth as possible and a critical success factor in employing natural solutions is a collaborative network, strong institutional and community support. And we've actually seen this kind of network building and flourishing through our own program uh, with farmers at every intersection offering resources and tips to their newfound regenerative community. Um, so slow, might seem counterintuitive when we're faced with the urgency of the climate situation. Uh, but the thing is, I think when slow is intentional, sustained and aligned to nature, it can have a powerful impact. Wonderful, thank you very much. Hannah and then Diana. Um, I think I'll go first about the challenge that we're currently facing. 
Um, we're currently trying to increase awareness from the local community because most people in rural areas uh, found the concept of climate crisis as something that is quite difficult to understand. Therefore, our challenge is to make them aware that this is a real issue, this is a real situation, and it needs real handling. And we're trying to deliver the message through a different approach to them. Um, so we're incorporating the message through their daily activities. And instead of doing um, a slides presentation, we're doing it with hands-on practices where they can jump right into the cases. And um, our trained youths uh, are the one who are uh, playing the role as facilitator. So um, it's, it's always the help with the youths because we have so many youths here uh, in Indonesia and we're trying to um, make use of it because they know so much, they have the creativity. So with them, uh, we're always finding a way of how to approach one local communities to another. Yeah, thank you. Diana, back to you in Los Angeles. Yes, we, we have three challenges, uh, politeness, um, knowledge and awareness. And you can laugh, but politeness is sort of like politics in a way. Um, and it reminds me of the three questions, Mr. Gore, that you teach in the climate reality training. Uh, must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So with politeness, um, our project is the Sepulveda Basin. It's 2,000 acres of federally owned land managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the heart of the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, but the city leases space for recreational purposes. So what has happened since the city has been leasing space for so, uh, so long is that there's been this polite, you know, hands off approach that uh, the state and federal uh, government doesn't want to get involved because they think that's the city's territory. But the city is not actually looking out for uh, the kind of uh, system change we need within this, this space. Um, and so uh, must we change? We must no longer accept politeness. So we have uh, uh, worked on that to try to you know, involve and bring in state and, and federal um, because they are holding the larger purse strings at this point for natural solutions. So we're trying to connect those dots. Secondly is knowledge. And, you know, the can we change is like, yes, we can. And we have the knowledge to do this. In fact, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a program called Engineering with Nature. And they have seen a feasibility envisioning study that was produced by the River Project that shows how this 2000 acre area could just be an emerald gem and and as i mentioned before uh, have a tremendous uh, impact on uh, mitigating climate change so um the the key there is to in, empower and encourage and you know uh, again really uh reach out and get them involved and ask them to put into place the knowledge that they have uh to start to make these changes and then finally is awareness and that's um that you know people don't when people don't know what the vision is uh they can't advocate for it and so we have uh um, that's one of the challenges is just to simply go out and make as many organizations and influential individuals in the community aware of the potential of uh, restoring this project using um, this area, using natural resources. Well, uh, <clears throat> moving on to the next question, despite the challenges that you all have faced, you're all obviously incredibly accomplished in your work of advancing uh, natural solutions. Can you share an example or two of how you have successfully mobilized your community uh, to take action on this issue? Chris, uh, Christy, would you start us off on this one? Sure, of course. Um, so, well, made possible actually by the immense support of Climate Reality Project and Climate Reality's incubator uh, the Global Shapers Port of Spain hub, in collaboration with its partners, Wasamaki Ecosystems, Y Farm, Market Movers, and UnQ, um, they've created. We've created a program to train community food guardians 
in regenerative food production. And so the educational arm of our project covers the impact of food systems on climate change, permaculture, syntropic farming, uh, regenerative agriculture. And then within, within that, there are elements of composting, waste management, fundamentals of soil, um, and a very crucial element is actually agricultural entrepreneurship in the digital age. And so many of our food guardians have actually started to make immediate changes to their farming systems, reducing pesticides, setting up the syntropic plots, um, and then additionally, supported by micro grants, they will go on to develop and implement their own projects, promoting security and climate resilience in their communities. So the ripple effect is place. Okay, wonderful. Who wants to go next? Diana? Sure. Um, well, we have, our chapter has a strong legislative focus. Um, so the first thing we did was reach out to our state senator and assembly members and even some city council um, representatives to let them know about the vision, this uh, potential of utilizing natural resources in the Sepulveda Basin. And from there, because, you know, Los Angeles is such a, um, a large city and it can have a global impact. So if, if we can have a successful uh, use of nature-based solutions here in this 10 million uh, population city, then other large cities around the world might look at that and say, hey, what did you, what did you do there? <laughs> How'd you guys do that? So we then went to not just our own representatives, we reached out and set up meetings up and down the state with other state um, uh, senators and assembly members and have continued to reach out to city council members as well. Uh, so that's that's one thing we did. And then, of course, you know, any kind of uh, any representative uh, has to, uh, you know, think about their constituents. So we got the input to build a community coalition. And so that's what we started to do, too. We started reaching out to other organizations. Um, and again, that's back to the awareness and just really uh, shared the River Project's feasibility study with them and, and educated them uh, about what could happen in an area that's right in their backyard. So everyone that saw it was like, well, why don't we do that? That, that seems doable. It is doable. We know it's doable. So um, we then create, we wrote a resolution, a formal resolution that we are now in the process of having other organizations sign on to so that we can now go back to the legislative um, folks that we've met with and say, look, it's not just us that wants this, it's the entire community that wants it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, um, Yui, and then uh, Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Well, um Ways we've been able to mobilize community is, but first of all, take picture of the fact that I I have had the opportunity to work in a non term organization from Forest Resource Office and the Pan African Center for Climate Policy, the Development International, and lots more. Mm -hmm. and, and I also pastor um, young youth in a church. So um, these are all my um, uh, my platforms where I'm able to mobilize communities at different levels and with uh, uh, research to understand over the years that is a great tool to mobilize communities because one of the type of research is a uh, research that I've been able to do over the years is um, uh, uh, household household surveys where I go into my communities of organize survey and I go from one house to another to find the households, asking them questions of different things and get individual perspectives. And I realize when I go around asking them, the, uh, the next thing to follow up is monitoring. When you engage, when you bring, when you come back with their results to them on evaluation is another means to gain their trust and to involve them in the program that uh, uh, they did not believe they could be part of. So in conducting my socioeconomic research in forest communities, 
running environmental awareness programs on radio, managing conservation, um, community conservation programs and livelihood projects, engaging with national stakeholders on climate change projects and programs. I have been able to contribute to policies and programs for women support in rural communities. I have been able to organize symposia and uh, workshops for, for discussions around the solution in climate change decisions and uh, programs. I've also established environmental education programs in schools and organized school programs. So far, uh, I've been able, as a result, uh, I've used arts and entertainment as a major tool to bring young people especially together. Last year, or early, late this year, around June, I, I led my team to organize a sports tournament and also an environmental modeling tournament, which brought together young people in different communities to play football for trees and to model for trees. We were able to plant over 500 trees in one week, which we have not been able to do so over the past years. And this was very successful to us. We, 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 we are working now towards uh, an arts parade where we are bringing together children from schools to parade and talk about climate change on the street. This has not been done in my community before. And this is going, we did it uh, early this year and we are doing it again in uh, November. So this is the first, of the, the first of its kind being brought to our community by us. And this has, we have noticed that with arts, we have been able to pull both the old, the young, and um, the, 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 uh, the differently able and all classes of people into our space of climate advocacy. And that has given us a wide audience, reaching 5, 000, over 5,000 women, developing over 20, uh, helping communities to develop over 20 forest policies in their area, getting over 20% uh, of women involved in decision-making platforms and programs, reaching 500 children in schools, and planting over 10,000 indigenous tree species mm -hmm. in rural communities, in 162 communities. So we, are very, um, we think our strategy has been working, and we are looking forward to empower more people and to increase our strategy so we can reach a wider audience. Wow, that's, uh, that's fantastic. We have a saying in the U.S., you go, girl. Uh, so, uh, Hannah, you're, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Uh, as we are trying to get in contact with local communities and also youth climate leaders, we are using social media a lot, especially Instagram to promote our events uh, through Instagram feed, Instagram story, and we publish um, announcements to be our volunteers or facilitators through social media as well. And um, this has been helping out a lot because oh, we have met um, new climate leaders, we have met facilitators, and they're all very great. They have different backgrounds. And again, they have a very different um, creativity to um, be, be in charge in a few uh, things that we have planned. And um, we are also using the website and then the, the, the other social media to um, publish, to announce the things that we are currently doing. Because again, we're targeting the local communities, uh, so we are um, um, approaching them so they can see the whole uh, information about the things that we're currently doing and about the, the events that we are uh, needing them to collaborate. So uh, she is helping us a lot. But now, as we have a loosened regulation of COVID-19, we also do face-to-face uh, -face meetings whenever possible. And it has been a great um, way to meet with the leaders because uh, we can share stories, brainstorm, and solve problems directly with them. That's from me. Yeah, that's great. That, uh, fa fantastic. I'm so inspired by all of you. We, we have a lot of people tuning into this conversation who themselves want to become catalysts for change, uh, just like the four of you uh, are. Um, what is one piece of advice that you might have for folks uh, attending this session who want to begin their work in advancing natural climate solutions. Uh, Diana, would you uh, uh, go first? What would you recommend? Well, um, you have to start somewhere, and um, and you shouldn't you shouldn't worry about not having the scientific knowledge. 
Um, we have a, a group within our chapter that is um, uh, is a focuses on rights of nature. So that's what led us to make public comment on the LA River. And that led mm. us to meet um, the founder and director, Melanie Winter of the River Project, who in fact created the feasibility and visioning study. We had her speak to our chapter and then she, and then we all wanted to help make that vision become a reality. So it was mm. about partnering with somebody who was in the space and all we had to do was just step up and be the climate advocates um, for that particular uh, vision. And we had to hold the vision too. So you don't have to create the vision. You don't have to have the scientific knowledge to, um, you know, to, to get in there and do something. But if you just stand up and say, I want this vision, and then you, you share that with you know everybody from legislative to community orgs then then you're involved then you're committed and you are part of the process and i think part of the solution yeah uh, fantastic uh, who would like to go next uh christy hannah yui yes sure um, thank you mr go uh i'll speak i'll speak uh, to the people who uh listening and uh, hearing about this regenerative agriculture and want to know more. Um, I'll say, first of all, that the ethos of regenerative farming is much more than an agricultural practice. It really calls on us to rediscover uh, our sense of belonging into the natural world and, you know, using our distinctive capacity as humans to heal the land and to create conditions conducive to more life, diversity and abundance. Um, so we would call on individuals to engage meaningfully in this kind of listening, healing and rediscovery to incorporate what we know is the Earth's wisdom and the wisdom of the past into a more resilient future. And so my advice would be to seek out knowledge holders of regenerative practices in your own communities to, to learn more about this. Thank you very much, Hannah, and then Yui. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gore. Um, this is very simple advice, but I think this is a super powerful one. Um, of course, which is to surround yourself with people who are willing to do the same thing as you, because uh, you'll be inspired of what they do and by what they do. And eventually you'll feel challenged in a positive way, of course, to do more actions. And it would feel like a competition, but in a very, very good way, because in the end, a collective action would be a hundred times better than doing it all. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Yui. All right. Um, one advice, piece of advice I want to give to the, everyone now, charge, step up, up and thrive. Take charge, step up, up, pick up and thrive. I started um, as an environmental and climate justice advocate nine years ago, almost 10 years now. And I was really young. I knew nothing about what I was coming into. I, I didn't know what to say, but I, I knew there was something about me that said I needed to give people a particular right to do justice for a particular right. And as time went on, I began finding my place and identifying where is. So in identifying my niche, over the years, I've been able to work and help lots of communities, especially women, to get their place. Many times we talk on paper, we talk on tables, but we don't step out on the field to do what we have to do. And that is why I'm ending this uh, advice today by saying that if you've been talking on tables, if you've been talking in books, you've been writing on paper, it's time for you to take charge. It's time for you to step up. It's time for you to pick up the shovel, pick up the trowel, step outside and thrive in that aspect. Let our table talk go to the field. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm going to stay with you again, because we know that effective communication is essential if we want to mobilize a, a movement for change. So I'm curious to hear from each one of you about how communication and storytelling play a role in your work for 
climate action. And I want to stay with you, Ioi, since you're the radio host of the group. Uh, you go first, and then we'll uh, go to each uh, of our other panelists. Then I'm going to give it back to Chris for audience uh, questions. Thank you, Ms. Argo. Yes, storytelling has been very uh, enticing for uh, me as a climate leader. And when I started research in forest communities in Cameroon, and I noticed the exclusion of women and girls from climate change projects and their decision making platforms, I decided to focus on these nature based solutions to solve these problems. And I was determined to see responsible decisions on sustainable natural resource management in Cameroon and across Africa. So I purposed in my heart to establish structures that support entrepreneurship and facilitate the channeling of royal voices, especially for women and young people for representation in national and international platforms. And I trained women on this livelihood project, which I mentioned earlier, and also working with young girls. And my goal is still to make sure that the voices of royal women are found in the House of Assembly in Cameroon and that they can also find a place with the United Nations Environmental Program that where uh, uh, girls can actually speak out, women can actually speak out royal people. So um, I adapted, I uh, worked with the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy to adopt a climate change curriculum, which uh, we have been implementing in schools. So when I, uh, I see young women admiring the work I do and dreaming of becoming like me someday, I know that I am doing something that is great. In one of our eco clubs where we are uh, implementing this climate change manual, we asked the kids to write a letter to the future. This was a creative tool, arts tool that I learned from um, uh, the Creative Arts Institute, Action Institute. So I, um, I use this tool in my class. And when I told these kids to write a letter to the future, one of them said in the letter that, when they grow up, they want to be like and see a we. And that was that was touching to me. In another instance, uh, I was mentoring this young lady who three months later she came to me and she said, And see, we I admire everything about you. I want to be like you. How do I become like you? This is this if anything, if there's anything in my work for climate that has been uh, inspirational and motivating to me. It has been this talk. On the, I, one day I was talking on radio and I did not know that there was, because we have these bikes, these motorbikes that carry people around Limbe. So what, I took a bike and I was going through a trail where we had planted trees on the road. So I, thought I, was, I looked at the trees and I said, oh, these our trees are growing. Praise God. We are finally going to have some pool in Limbe. And the man who was carrying me on his bike turned around and he said, who are you? I said, no, we have been talking about the trees on the radio. And we keep having these trees cut down, being uh, destroyed and burned. But we are finally glad that we can have trees growing in Limbe at this point. He stepped down from his bike and he, turned, he started looking at me. He said, so you are the voice that has been speaking on the radio. I said, do you listen to our programs? He said, yes, I listen. I said, but why don't you call us? Why don't you participate? He says, I'm always busy, but I listen to every bit of your program. And I'm finally glad to meet you. I said, hey, stop making me feel like a star. He said, you are a star, and I'm glad to meet you. Please, can I take a picture with you? And I was so, 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 so inspired and motivated. And that led me to continue plastic trees in my area. <laughs> oh, that's a congratulations, Huey. That's a, what, what a wonderful story. We're running short on uh, time here, so let's go into the lightning round. Uh, and uh, uh, Diana, Hannah, and Christy, uh, brief responses to that last question, because I got to get it back to Chris so she can ask the audience questions. Yeah, so storytelling is is uh, very important. Uh, our resolution creates a uh, has a little bit of the backstory of LA, how we got here. And, and what we want to see for the future. So, so we've condensed our story there uh, and we've written an op-ed so we can point people to that. But the funniest thing, I'll make this short, is that when our local senator, I spoke to him at a meeting and he said, wow, you sure made an impression on Secretary Wade Crowfoot the California Natural Resources. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he, he's so impressed with what you guys are doing. 
So, you know, just simply talking about it and sharing the story, it has a rippling effect. So um, just, just yeah. talk about Good it with you. whoever you can. Fantastic. Hannah and Christy? Hey, thank you, Mr. Gore. Um, we have the impact of storytelling. Um, so when we are um, hearing stories from the leader of communities or the one who is in charge in agroforestry, for example, of climate disaster risk, reduction um when we heard stories from them it always feels like few questions pop up in our mind like uh, what should i do what can i help to contribute and by hearing the stories we always bring it back to the team to discuss uh, what kind of action that we can uh, collaborate together with them and from that from the impact that we have um experienced we are um throwing it again uh, through social media of course um, so we retell the story to the public so people can uh, also contribute and um, help us in contributing to the other organization or communities uh, to find the solution of the um, problem. Thank you. Christy? Yes. Um, yeah, we have uh, incredible stories within our Food For You program um, because of the the amazing diversity in our food guardians. Uh, and these stories have to be amplified. Uh, for example, we have a female farmer with 50 plus years of experience managing her own rural farm in Toku. Uh, we have someone in real estate planning to set up homesteads in Trinidad with the regenerative ethos. Uh, we have agricultural PhD candidates. We have formerly, uh, formerly trained farmers. We have th those who are just inheriting their family farms from their, their uh, parents, we have chicken farmers, goat farmers, aquaponics, hobbyists. We have a lawyer developing a cocoa estate and they span north, south, east and west of Trinidad. So these individual stories and, and their shared story for the, of their connection through the love and respect for the land, it really emboldens others to join this energetic movement. So. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank all four of you. What wonderful panelists. And this conversation on nature-based solutions is uh, so crucial for promoting the overall health of our planet and reducing carbon emissions. And your communities are very lucky to have your leadership and your efforts serve as an inspiration to us all. Now I'm going to hand it back to you, Chris. I'm sorry to go a little bit over time. I know you've got some questions from uh, some of our audience some members, but thanks again to our outstanding panelists for all that you do. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Thank you for that powerful and empowering discussion, Mr. Gore, Yui, Christy, Diana, and Hannah. We are now going to open things up and invite our audience to join the conversation with Q&A with our panelists. All right, we have our first question. The USDA is focusing on equity and new solutions to support small farmers and family farms. But in 2023, the Farm Bill needs more large scale support for sustainable farming practices. The question, how can we influence funding in the US and elsewhere to go to more sustainable farm practices? And the second question, is what can climate reality members do to change government support for this change? Would someone like to start? That sounds like a Christy uh, question. Uh, <laughs> uh, sort of, I was actually going to say that I think uh, the lobbying that Diana has done is, is quite an exemplar for uh, what's necessary and uh, I recently heard someone who has been in this climate fight for a long time say that political will is a renewable resource. <laughs> and so I, I think that, um, yeah, just continuing to push, I, I, I would say anyone who's doing activism and lobbying at the government level directly to the source is, is doing uh, an excellent job because we can't give up the hope that they will uh, this will of theirs will be revitalized by our um, action. I I know I can add a little bit to that too. Yeah, uh, Chris, is that uh, 
Um, there's someone from our chapter was uh, interested in that uh, farm bill and reached out to Los Angeles chapter and then other chapters around um, the United States are also involved. So, so just simply reaching out and building a bigger coalition uh, to to have a bigger voice um, is is a really a good way to to have you know to make comment on the bill. Very true. Second yeah. question: What do you uh, make sure, or excuse me, what did you do to make sure that you were incorporating the voices of the most vulnerable community members, and how did you actively involve them in the process? Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> okay, so um, I think um, I was about giving this, this response in the first uh, question. But one of the ways that um, I believe in bottom top, bottom top approach when it comes to uh, uh, influencing, um, getting communities involved in activism or in climate action and empowering the person at the local level building their capacities giving them the skills that they need that can put them at the position where they need to go is essential if we need to be able to create the change that we want the reason uh, some of um, decisions are made without involving the local the uh, rural, rural person or the rural woman or the rural man is because they are not effective players but we live in a society now, you don't need to have a bachelor's degree for your voice to be heard. You don't need to have a PhD degree for your voice to be heard. You need to be schooled in your area. And I believe that the people in the rural communities, they have indigenous knowledge, which is neglected when we are involved in policy development and decision making. And we need this indigenous knowledge. When I was carrying out my research in 2020, I realized these people knew about climate change, but they did not call it climate change. They called it differently. That was how they perceived it. And I came with a huge term and started calling climate change to them, but they knew it differently. And when I decided to sit with them and realize what they were actually saying, I realized that they are voicing we make change and a great impact in our decisions. So let's empower them first. Let's build their capacity Let's make them financially stable. Let's give them the knowledge that they need. And then we give them opportunities and platforms to present that knowledge. Yes. Um, Last question. Like oh. <laughs> I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add of what uh, Iwi just said about empowering the communities, because I would 100% agree with that. That's what we do. The climate strategy in Indonesia, we are um, empowering them. We have trainings and we have a um, few workshops. So uh, first they understand what's happening and next they know what they have to do um, for the next step because it's, it's very important. And then um, of course, uh, by always keeping it in contact, uh, just be there for them. So if, if anything happens, if they need help, at least if they need um, someone to talk to, they can always have us um, in, their, in their context. So um, that's, that's uh, one way to keeping them um, uh, involved in, in things that we're doing. Thank you. Last question, quick responses. What gives you all hope that will solve the climate crisis? Can I? What? <laughs> Please, Diana. Okay. Okay. Diana, I just want to. I would, I'll just. I'll just go quickly. Is that whenever it's humans against nature, um, you know, humans can gain some ground, but they never win ultimately. And uh, and so, and we see that all all around. Uh, what's what's happening? You know, in the different. Uh, uh, climate uh, tragedies lately, but it gives me hope that knowing that nature has the ability to right itself. And if we can just support that process using these natural solutions to allow it to return to its more natural state, 
that's where I find hope. And that's why I enjoy doing work in this particular niche of climate change. Yui? Thank you. Um, for me, hope is with the children I work with, the Echo Club. That is a generation that is growing and impacting them with climate change knowledge now means some of them are going to live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. They will be talking about climate change from five, from 10 years old until they are 70. So that is the message that will be passed across generations. And I, I, I have hope because there is a gap that is being breached between the older generation and the younger generation. And even after they pass, another generation would have been raised, which can continue with the climate change message. So that is my hope. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Before we go, I want to once again thank our incredible panelists. Thank you, Yui, Christy, Diana, and Hannah, and along with Vice President Gore. I want to also thank you for being here today and being a part of this conversation. We have one more dialogue today focused on how we can build inclusive green communities. And if you're able, I invite you to stick around. I also want to invite you to continue to be a part of the 24 hours of reality by checking stories of people just like you taking action on climate all across the planet. You can find those on our Instagram at climate reality and by visiting our website, www.24hoursofreality.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>